Okay, awesome. So we're going to be talking about um, neurosurgery trauma. It's going to be like a brief overview of some of the, the very basic um, you know, fundamentals of what we deal with when we're looking um, at a traumatic case. Um, focusing around the uh, decompressive hemicraniectomy. And uh, just to reintroduce ourselves, um, I'm Simon Suzdekani, and I am a fourth year uh, resident at USC. And I'm going to be presenting with uh, Shivani Rangwala, also a fourth year resident at USC. Um, so I know you guys all come from different back backgrounds, and I'll try to fill in and make things uh, more vague when indicated. Um, but we are just going to kind of start from the basics and I'll give you a little overview and history of um, traumatic brain injury or TBI. And it's a very common um, and significant cause of disability um, and death in the United States. There's actually 150 deaths from TBI daily in the United States, um, which is a shocking figure. Um, and it's a significant cause of um, healthcare costs. Uh, and also a fundamental aspect of our training. Um, I think every resident will say uh, in every major city that there's um, a ton of trauma that comes through and it's something that's just realistic that happens. Um, and it embodies a, a really significant aspect of our ICU training um, and also our like patient evaluation skills early on in residency. Um, and then, you know, it really ties in well and significantly with our intensive care um, training. So uh, when you're a junior and you get the um, consult that a trauma came in, you're thinking about um, the whole body and the whole person um, from the moment they arrive. Um, and so it, it's a really um, important thing to get uh, familiar with. And so I hope that this lecture is fun for everybody. Um, the interesting stuff that we actually found about the history of trauma craniotomies is that, is that they have been, um, putting people, like, putting holes in people's skulls, uh, as, as early as 10,000 BC. Um, and they've discovered this by looking at, um, old skull collections. And so, um, I'm not going to attempt to, um, pronounce some of these uh, terms. However, um, there are collections of, um, of skulls that demonstrate that that these bones are uh, from 10,000 BC and that and people were um, uh, creating like burr holes in them. And um, they like most like, I guess the oldest formal description of a decompressive hemicraniectomy uh, was in 1896. Um, and it was somebody that, um, you know, wrote it up in their uh, graduate thesis in, in French. Um, and uh, I'm not fluent in French, but I'll try to say le hemicraniectomie temporaire. Um, and it's probably like a temporizing measure for um, people under high intracranial pressure. And then um, the uh, large, large one that we're familiar with today and that we're gonna be going over um, is uh, something that was described by Coker in, in 1901. Um, and for those of you that um, are either done with sub eyes or starting sub eyes or will consider rotating, you should all be familiar with Coker's point. Um, and uh, these are just some um, really interesting uh, old uh, photos that I found is really cool paper um, from 2019 that's a review of the history of decompressive hemicraniectomy and I encourage you to all uh, take a look at it. It's a pretty easy read. Um, and it just shows like uh, some, some diagrams and some old instruments that they used to use. You can see on the top right here, um, things have changed but they also like kind of haven't. Um, so um, it's, you know, maybe we now have like a, like a power drill instead of a hand drill but um, we, uh, we still essentially just make holes. We connect the holes and then we take the skull off. And you can see here, um, the, the, the way that the brain flap and, um, hole diagram is on the right. It'll be a little different in a few slides to come, but again, it's generally the same concept. So it's really, it's really interesting, um, to see, because as, um, I was saying in another session that I was in, um, there's a lot of uh, room for innovation in, in neurosurgery. And I think it's it's very evident that, especially in the setting of TBI, once the brain takes that really bad hit, um, there's not much we can do. And so one of the main things that we we focus on is trying to um, relieve that, that obstructive skull uh, because we know that that brain's going to swell. So I just have like a descriptive um, uh, CT scan here that demonstrates a gunshot wound to the head. Um, and you can see um, those of you that maybe aren't as familiar with CT scans, the bone is very bright white. Uh, CT scans are just uh, 
like three dimensional, very fast bunch of x-rays that um, show us uh, acute blood. They can show us bone really well. And then the, the brain is just sort of this general gray. Um, and acute blood is um, demonstrated here on the right side. So remember, um, formal imaging is always a mirror image. So the right's on the left. Uh, and so this patient has sustained a um, pretty horrible gunshot wound to the, to the posterior ac aspect of the occipital lobe of the brain. And um, that is causing some streak artifact from the, from the CT scanner. So that's just like an artifact of the, of the imaging. And, and you can see that the blood collection is um, in the compartment outside of the brain um, and it's pushing on the brain towards the midline. And so um, this is called a subdural fluid collection or hematoma. Um, you can tell that it's different um, than what would be an epidural hematoma because it's actually, um, you know, it's it's not a um, lentiform. So an epidural is more like a lentiform shape um, and a subdural is more like a crescent shape. Um, so um, this is a subdural hematoma, it's causing midline shift. And on the left, left side, we have an axial view of the brain. And on the right side, we have a coronal view. Um, again, you can see the right side has a, um, pretty significant uh, subdural hematoma collection, and it is causing midline shift or, or compression of the brainstem um, and the, the basal cisterns. So we're just gonna go over some like uh, basic concepts about um, the trauma setting. And the first thing I'm writing here is know the ABCs. Um, and they stand for airway, breathe, uh, blood and circulation. Uh, breathing. Breathing and circulation. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Um, so this is often, um, on test questions and uh, on the boards, actually, I think there were two questions I just took on my written boards. Um, even though a patient can come in and you know, by looking at them, let's say they have a big bruise on their head, that they have something going on intracranially, um, you have to address their ABCs first. So you need to make sure that they have a protected airway, that they're getting enough oxygen and that their um, you know, circulatory system, that they're hemodynamically stable. Um, once you know all of that, you can get imaging and further sort of deduce what you need to do. Um, and then, um, GTA is sort of like general endotracheal anesthesia, which is what um, all of these patients will be under when they undergo a decompressive hemicraniectomy. Uh, and it's important when you're positioning these patients uh, to take into consideration, as I mentioned, like the whole patient. Uh, do they have to be under C-spine precautions? Um, do they, um, you know, have other injuries that you need to take um, into consideration. And when you're at a big trauma center, you'll have a trauma team that's also been evaluating the patient and you'll have um, some sort of insight and you should have some sort of insight of what else is going on. Because if a patient has a hemothorax and a large amount of blood in their lung and they won't even make it through a general uh, anesthesia procedure, then uh, you should probably not do the case because you wanna avoid a intraoperative um, uh, mortality. So I'll let Shivani sort of take over a little bit about um, you know, positioning the patient and what sort of um, aspects you need to take into consideration from, a, from an anatomical perspective. Thanks. So um, you know, going back, so let's say you have already addressed the, the ABCs and the patient gets a CT scan that we already saw. They do have a right subdural mm -hmm. hematoma causing midline shift. And the next step is you know, that you need to take the bone off. You need to get um, uh, them stabilized and taken up to the OR. Um, you get them to the OR, lots of things to consider. And a lot of times it's going to be as a neurosurgical resident, you're going to have people there to help you. Um, you're you're going to have your chief resident and your attendings, but this is kind of one, one of the bread and butter um, cases that you end up learning as a junior resident. Um, and you'll kind of fine tune your skills over the years, but the, the concept is the same. Um, you always want to mark out midline. You always need to have a baseline of what you're looking at um, and some sort of frame of reference. So the midline as kind of identified here, that's where the superior sagittal sinus is. That's a big um, venous structure that you do not want to get into. So um, you wanna mark that out. You wanna know where the middle of the head is because hemicrany, you're taking out half the skull. You're taking out one half of the skull. Um, so that kind of gives you um, some frame of reference. And then the other frame, the other thing you wanna mark out um, is 
that helps you mark out the rest of the incision is going to be the zygomatic arch. It's going to be right anterior to the ear um, on that side. So on the, the patient that we just talked about on the right side, you look at the right ear and feel for palpate for that zygomatic arch. And that's kind of a couple centimeters off a, or like a centimeter or so off of midline, you're going to draw this hemicraniectomy incision all the way from the, you know, midline all the way down, hairline, um, all the way down to the zygomatic arch. And it's going to be this big question mark in shaped incision or C-shaped incision. Um, other things to keep in mind is you want to, you know, try to be behind the hairline, but a lot of times, um, and that's kind of your frame of reference, you don't want to be on the forehead making your incision. Um, and then you want to be cognizant of the ear and um, other structures. Once you mark out the incision, you're going to, you know, prep and drape and get started right with the crany. So once you are draped and scrubbed in, um, you're going to make that incision. You're going to identify, um, reflect back the skin flap, and then you're going to be down on bone. And you're gonna, similar to the first slides that we showed, you're gonna make these burr holes and you're gonna connect the dots. So you're gonna make these burr holes, most likely, um, you know, a couple along the sagittal sinus, along the midline, one inferiorly, um, and one at the keyhole, um, which is the most anterior point. And um, you'll connect the um, burr holes and this kind of lets you carefully reflect the bone um, off the, off the dura. Um, sometimes in trauma cranies, sometimes you get through the dura, sometimes you tear the dura and that's unfortunately can happen. Um, and it's not the end of the world. Um, when you have something like an epidural where the dura is pushed away from the bone, um, you actually don't have that issue a lot because you have this epidural hematoma or this hematoma that's separating the dura and the bone. Um, and the bone comes off a little bit easier, but sometimes with subdurals, that dura can really stick to the lining of the um, skull. Key things to um, that every resident will quickly learn is once they do the crany, once the bone is off, there's areas that um, you know can bleed pretty profusely. The bone can bleed as well. So there's lots of things you learn as you do more and more hemicranies, how to stop both tissue bleeding as well as bone bleeding. Um, and a lot of times the easiest way to stop bone bleeding would be wax versus, versus um, tissue bleeding. You have electrocautery that you use during the surgery. I don't know. Um, so this slide um, yeah. just kind of goes over um, more of the anatomical landmarks. Um, actually, if we go back to the last one, I just want to, because it, it sort of is a oh, preemptive um, doc. You want to make sure that when you're doing a decompressive hemicraniectomy that you're getting all the way down to the, to the floor of the temporal fossa. So the skull has an anterior um, frontal fossa, a um, middle temporal fossa, and a posterior fossa. And so, um, the the real goal is that you don't want the brain to swell medially into the brainstem. You want to give it space to swell laterally. And really the most important place that it can do this is by making sure that your bone uh, decompression is flush with the floor of the temporal fossa. And my uh, post-operative CT scan will, will demonstrate that in a second. Yeah, you can, you can fast forward to that. So you can see here, so this actually is a scan that kind of shows that there's maybe a little bit more space that I, uh, Whoever did this, uh, I think it was me, but I think this was from an M and M. So something that was like something we learned from um, is uh, maybe going down a little bit further because you, as you can see, the brain isn't very happy there. Um, it wants ideally you would have a completely flat edge here, and so if you go back to the previous slide the burr holes that you make and the cuts that you make will help you achieve that. Um, and so you're going all the way down to um, that temporal floor uh, by, by, by taking a, a ronger and, or a double action and, and biting off all this bone um, and, uh, and making sure that the brain has sufficient um, space to, uh, to decompress. And so I, I hope you guys got a little bit um, of an insight into um, 
you know, what a decompressive hemicraniectomy is like. It usually takes about an hour and a half start to finish and, and doing it um, quickly is really important for uh, patient safety, especially in the, in the trauma setting. Uh, these patients come in, they often will go into um, trauma coagulopathy and, and, and their, their blood um, will get very thin, very fast. And so you have to work efficiently and get the patient safely back into the intensive care unit. Um, and then this patient also here has a um, EVD or an external ventricular drain that will monitor uh, their intracranial pressure and further assist your, um, your uh, ICU care. Yeah, and this is something that everyone, you know, trauma neurosurgery, I think you can have a big, really nice impact on patient lives. I've seen, we all have patients where we did the hemicrani on them. They were um, comatose or in very critical condition. And, you know, we see them walk into clinic six months later. And I think it's a very satisfying surgery to do um, and to see a direct result from. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.